Hi, my name's Ollie, and in this Politics Explained video, I'm going to go through everything you need to know about ministerial responsibility in A-level politics. So that's not just all the knowledge you need to know with some really key specific examples, but also all the key points of analysis you could use in your essays and the key essay questions you could get asked so you can be fully prepared for the exam. So I'm going to start by looking at the um, key potential essay questions and key debates you could get asked about. From there, I'm going to look at individual ministerial responsibility, looking at the concept of individual ministerial responsibility, some complications and recent changes to it, and then looking at some key examples of individual ministerial responsibility, some where it has applied and some where it hasn't, before finally looking at the, the overall debate about how important it is. From there, I'm effectively going to do the same um, for collective ministerial responsibility. Um, so first looking at the concept of collective ministerial responsibility, then looking at some limits and exceptions to it, and then going into the examples and the debate over how important it is. So yeah, if you want to um, access the PDF um, that you should be seeing up there, go to the first link in the description to the Politics Explained website, where you can also find a place to sign up for tutoring, if that's something you'd be interested in, as well as lots of um, free and paid resources to help you in your uh, politics A-level, including essay plans, um, example essays, and kind of complete everything you need to know guides with all of the content. So yeah, that's pretty much everything. Without further ado, let's get into it. So starting off with um, the key potential essay questions and key debates you could get asked and the parts of the specification this lesson covers. So this, this lesson quite simply covers the concept of ministerial responsibility. It's in um, the UK government part of A-level politics um, and it's in the prime minister and executive topic. In terms of the key debates you could get asked in relation to this topic, there's kind of really kind of one key debate, um, and that's whether individual and collective ministerial responsibilities still apply and how important they are as conventions. If you make a detailed plan on the question in bold, um, evaluate the view that the concepts of individual ministerial responsibility and collective ministerial responsibility are both still important, then you should be really well prepared um, for this topic. I will um, soon have a plan um, as part of uh, a package of UK government essay plans on the Politics Explained website for this question if you want to kind of purchase that instead of making it yourself, though it can be really useful and, and helpful for revision um, to make it yourself. So yeah, lots of questions here which kind of effectively the same question but worded differently, um, some of which kind of just include individual, some of which just include collective, but if you plan a really detailed um, plan for the one in bold then you should be really well prepared. So yeah, starting off with individual ministerial responsibility and looking at the concept of individual ministerial responsibility. So when did it begin? Prior to the 1994 Nolan principles, there was no real codification of the responsibilities of government ministers and what was expected of them. And these Nolan principles out outlined seven key principles that were expected of government ministers. So that's um, leadership, honesty, accountability, openness, selflessness, integrity, and objectivity. And then a few years later, after Tony Blair won the 1997 election, these were set out in the Ministerial Code, which is published by the Prime Minister at the start of each administration to make clear the expectations of government ministers. So this is where individual and collective ministerial uh, responsibility are both set out in the Ministerial Code. Individual ministerial responsibility is a convention rather than being a statute law passed by Parliament that is binding. So even though it's written in the Ministerial Code and set out by the Prime Minister at the start of every government, um, it's not binding um, and it's effectively the Prime Minister saying this is the standards of the office, this is what you should um, be doing, but there's kind of no statute law that forces the Prime Minister to kind of abide by it or, or apply it um, and there's no statute law suggesting that um, the Prime Minister kind of has to include it in the Ministerial Code, it's a convention. Um, so what does individual ministerial responsibility set out as a convention? So all government ministers, including the Prime Minister, are drawn from Parliament and are therefore accountable to it. And this is both in relation to their responsibility for the performance of their department and their integrity and personal conduct. So there's kind of two key parts um, or two key kind of ways that um, individual ministerial responsibility applies. First one of these is in terms of you're responsible for your department when you're a minister. And the second of these is you're responsible for your personal conduct and you're responsible to Parliament um, for both of these. So the, in, in relation to the first of these, the current ministerial code sets out that ministers have a duty to Parliament to account and be held to account for the policies, decisions and actions of their departments and agencies. So that's the idea that government ministers are responsible for the running policies and performance of their departments and can be held to account by Parliament for this. Um, and that's key to individual ministerial responsibility. So the ministers themselves are responsible for the whole of their department and the workings of that department. 
Ministers are expected, expected to accept responsibility for any failures or criticisms of their department. And if there are any key, really big key failures um, and they're un, or they're kind of unable to effectively run their department, then they're expected to resign. And it kind of it's accepted that a minister can't be expected to know kind of everything that's going on in their department or be responsible for every small thing um, and kind of shouldn't be forced to resign due to minor mistakes. But if it's on a kind of key failure um, or kind of they're failing overall in the running of the department, then they should resign. Or if they refuse to resign, they should be forced to resign um, by the prime minister or kind of forced to make resign, uh, make resign by the prime minister. The current ministerial code sets out um, it is of paramount importance that ministers give accurate and truthful information to parliament, correcting any inadvertent error at the earliest opportunity. Ministers who knowingly mislead Parliament will be expected to offer their resignation to the Prime Minister. So it's not just that responsibility um, for the running of the department. Um, another key part of this part of ministerial responsibility um, is that ministers are obliged to give accurate information to Parliament and resign if they knowingly mislead Parliament. Um, and if they kind of accidentally mislead Parliament, then they're supposed to correct that um, as soon as possible. So that, that's the first type of individual ministerial responsibility, the kind of first part of it responsibility for the department and that includes responsibility for any kind of key failings in the department um, and the fact that you can't mislead parliament. The second kind of part of it is responsibility for personal conduct. So ministers are also responsible for their personal conduct and professionalism. If their personal conduct falls below what is expected of them they're expected to offer their resignation. Um, this kind of rather than responsibility for department is a far more con common cause of ministerial resignations than departmental failures. So the ministerial code sets out that ministers of the crown are expected to maintain high standards of behaviour and behave in a way that upholds the highest standards of propriety. Um, so the ministerial code also specifically states harassing, bullying or other inappropriate and discriminating behaviour wherever it takes place is not consistent with the ministerial code and will not be tolerated. So this kind of these personal conduct failings that can cause resignations and ministers are supposed to kind of uphold standards of personal conduct. So these failings can take place in a number of different ways and there's, there's numerous different examples. Um, of ministers who've kind of fallen below those standards of um, personal conduct. But kind of one key example cited in the ministerial code is, is kind of bullying, um, harassment, kind of inappropriate behaviour. So bullying, for example, with a couple of um, recent examples, Dominic Raab um, is currently being kind of investigated um, for bullying of civil servants and Priti Patel um, has been accused of it by many different civil, service, civil servants in the past as well. So they're the two key parts of individual ministerial responsibility. Crucially, is how it's enforced. So though they're supposed to be advised by their independent advisor, and they are advised by their independent advisor, it's ultimately the prime minister that enforces the ministerial code. And a really good way you can refer to this in your essays is that the prime minister is judge, jury, and executioner. And that means that the enforcement of individual ministerial responsibility is kind of entirely dependent on the prime minister. The prime minister decides if there's been um, a breaking of ministerial responsibility in relation to responsibility for department or personal conduct, um, and then the prime minister is supposed to force people to resign if they've broken it and they don't offer their resignations um, themselves. As we've seen with Partygate, though, there's no mechanism to hold the prime minister themselves to account um, when they're accused of wrongdoing. So if the prime minister is the one who enforces the, the ministerial code and enforces individual ministerial responsibility, there's no one to really enforce it if the Prime Minister breaks it. So, now I'm going to look at some complications and recent changes to individual ministerial responsibility. The first of these is civil servants being blamed. And this is especially in the kind of past decade, past couple of decades. Um, there have been instances where the lines of accountability have been blurred and civil servants have, have been held accountable for failings within departments rather than government ministers. So traditionally, civil servants were anonymous and took no credit or blame for the actions of governments as it was the job of ministers to ensure that all civil servants um, had the necessary skills to carry out their roles effectively. And if there were failings within the department, even if civil servants played a role in it, it's the minister's fault because the minister runs the department and should ensure that civil servants are properly trained. Um, a couple of examples of this, in, in March 2023, Suella Braveman sent an email to Conservative Party supporters blaming an activist blob of left-wing lawyers, civil servants, and the Labour Party for the failure of her department to stop channel crossing. So that's where a minister is coming out and blaming civil servants for something going wrong in her department. Um, and another really good example from a, a couple of years ago is that after the failure of the exams algorithm um, in the summer of 2020, head of Ofqual, Sally Collier, resigned. So she was a civil servant 
um, having overseen, overseen the development of the algorithm. So it was a civil servant that resigned, whilst the Secretary of State for Education, Gavin Williamson, didn't resign. So that's kind of a more recent development where at points, civil servants have been taking the blame um, for failures within departments when individual ministerial responsibility holds that it's the minister's responsibility and they should take um, take the blame and resign if there are any major failings. Another kind of recent, um, kind of in the last couple of decades, recent complication is in relation to executive agencies. So some government functions are delegated to executive agencies on the, under director generals, rather than being under the direct control of government ministers. So these include the prison service, court service, the DVLA, um, so kind of they have kind of these um, executive agencies have kind of civil servants working for them as well, but they're not under direct ministerial control. And as a consequence, there's a lot of doubt um, and uncertainty about who should be held accountable for failures with the minister responsible for the overall policy area. So they're responsible for um, kind of getting rid of the executive agency, giving the executive agency direction. Um, but the director generals exercise operational responsibility of the executive agencies themselves. So there's a lot of kind of confusion. It's not sure who should take responsibility if there's a big failure within one of these executive agencies. In 1995, Home Secretary Michael Howard controversially sacked Derek Lewis, the Director General of the Prison Service, after criticism of the escape of prisoners from Pankhurst Jail. So that can be seen as kind of a limitation to individual ministerial responsibility um, because it's the Director Generals who are civil servants that are being blamed um, and taking responsibility rather than the ministers themselves. And obviously the kind of the kind of delegation of um, government roles to executive agencies really complicates that. And then probably the most important um, thing to know in relation to individual ministerial responsibility um, is that around a year ago, in May 2022, Boris Johnson made some changes to the ministerial code. So after the Partygate scandal broke out and dominated the news, Boris Johnson revised the ministerial code. Um, and there's a lot of suspicion that he did so to prevent himself and many of his ministers having to resign over Partygate, as he and, and others, including Rishi Sunak, the current prime minister, had misled Parliament. The key change Johnson made was to weaken the rules on individual ministerial responsibility so that ministers who breach the, breach the ministerial code are no longer expected to resign, but to publicly apologise and or accept a reduction in pay. And also mentions of honesty, transparency, integrity and accountability were removed from the foreword to the ministerial code, quite unsurprisingly. So this represents a real watering down of individual ministerial responsibility in response um, to Partygate and, and the fact that um, Boris Johnson and a lot of his ministers would, would have kind of well, certainly broke um, individual the ministerial code and individual ministerial responsibility in Partygate. So this is one key kind of thing you can use to suggest that potentially individual ministerial responsibility isn't very important anymore um, as Boris Johnson changed it. Obviously, that could be changed back in the future. The ministerial code has changed and kind of set out um, at the start of every prime minister's government. So that could be changed by Rishi Sunak in the future. Um, but at the time, it was a real kind of um, kind of watering down of individual ministerial responsibility. So yeah, that's everything um, in relation to the kind of concept of individual ministerial responsibilities, some kind of key recent developments. What I'm going to look at now is a number of examples of individual ministerial responsibility. Firstly, examples where ministers did resign, and secondly, examples where they didn't resign, and kind of what they show in relation to how much individual ministerial responsibility applies. Okay, so starting off with examples where ministers did resign. So the first of these is Estelle Morris in 2002. In 2002, Estelle Morris resigned as Secretary of State for Education and Skills after her department hadn't met the literacy and numeracy targets that they'd set for themselves. In her resignation letter to the Prime Minister, she stated, I'm less good at strategic management of a huge department and I'm not good at dealing with the modern media. I have not felt I have been as effective as I should be or as effective as you need me to be. She felt well equipped, equipped and suited to being Schools Minister, which she'd been previously, um, but not to being Secretary of State um, for Education and Skills, which is a much bigger job. And this therefore shows that individual ministerial responsibility in relation to responsibility for the department um, and re responsibility for departmental failures um, certainly used to be important, um, with a minister even resigning without being pushed to do so by the Prime Minister. Next example, 16 years later, is Amber Rudd. So in April 2018, Amber Rudd resigned as Home Secretary after inadvertently misleading the Home Affairs Select Committee. She had said to the committee that she was unaware of any deportation removal targets within the department, 
despite the evidence showing that she had documents that said exactly that. At the time, Rudd and the Home Officers were under massive media scrutiny over the Windrush scandal, and, and Rudd, um, yeah, Rudd resigned. This shows that um, individual ministerial responsibility in, in relation to responsibility for departmental failures and misleading parliament um, was still important for Rudd in 2018, though it can be considered that media pressure likely played a part in convincing her to offer her resignation rather than kind of simply following the ministerial code. Next example is Matt Hancock in 2021. So in June 2021, um, Matt Hancock, who was health secretary at the time, resigned after a video showed him having an extramarital affair with a colleague, which also meant he had breached his own government's um, COVID regulations, his own department's um, COVID reg resignations, COVID regulations, sorry. Um, Hancock originally just apologised, which the Prime Minister Boris Johnson accepted and said the matter was closed. But ultimately, the media and public backlash grew too big and he resigned a week later. So on the one hand, this could be used to show that individual ministerial responsibility in relation to personal conduct um, was still important under Boris Johnson as, as Hancock eventually did resign. On the other hand, the fact that Hancock originally tried to just apologise rather than resign and that Johnson accepted that um, could be used to show that individual ministerial responsibility, individual ministerial responsibility um, in relation to personal conduct wasn't important. Instead, it was the media and public backlash that proved important, uh, rather than kind of the convention of individual ministerial responsibility and the ministerial code actually applying. Um, another example I've got more recently is Suella Braverman in 2022. So in October 2022, Suella Braverman was forced to resign as Home Secretary under Liz Truss's administration. After it emerged, she had used her personal email to send classified information, which was a serious breach of the ministerial code. Braveman was forced to resign by trust, um, and in her resignation, she really criticised the Prime Minister, um, kind of really criticising the overall, the kind of government's overall mistakes, um, particularly in relation to the mini-budget, um, and saying that, effectively, um, she's accepted responsibility and is resigning after she's done something wrong, and the government and trust should effectively um, do the same. Despite her resignation, Braveman was though though was then reappointed as Home Secretary just weeks later by the new Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. So on the one hand, this shows how Prime Ministers can enforce individual ministerial responsibility when a minister has failed, um, and could be used to suggest that um, IMR um, was again important under trust. On the other hand, however, the fact that Braveman was reappointed by Sunak just weeks later um, shows the limits of individual ministerial responsibility's importance. Final example I've got. And it's the most recent one, and that's Nadim Zahawi in 2023. So in January 2023, um, Conservative Party Chairman Nadim Zahawi was forced to resign by Prime Minister Rishi Sunak after the PM's ethics advisor concluded Zahawi had breached the ministerial code by failing to tell officials he was under investigation by the tax authorities when appointed Chancellor under Boris Johnson. Sunak was criticised for not taking action sooner and described as weak, with it being suspected that the Prime Minister was waiting to see if the media pressure would die down, um, as Zahawi was an important government ally. This shows how individual ministerial responsibility in relation to personal conduct can still be seen as important under Rishi Sunak, though media pressure certainly did um, play a role. So there are the examples where ministers did resign. Now I'm going to look at five examples, I think it's five, um, where ministers didn't resign. The first of these is Chris Grayling in 2019. So in May 2019, Trans Transport Secretary Chris Grayling didn't resign despite serious failings in his department that included giving a multi-million pound ferry contract to a company that had never owned a ferry. The contract ultimately had to be cancelled at a major cost to the taxpayer. As a consequence of his failures, Grayling was ridiculed in the media and nicknamed Failing Grayling. This shows that individual ministerial responsibility in relation to the departmental failures wasn't important even with significant media pressure um, for a resignation, in part um, because forcing Grayling to resign would have admitted the government's failure. So the fact that there wasn't that resignation shows that what well, kind of suggests individual ministerial responsibility wasn't that important. Next example is Priti Patel in 2020. So in 2020, an independent investigation concluded that then Home Secretary Priti Patel had bullied civil servants which is a clear breach of individual ministerial responsibility in relation to personal conduct. Patel failed to offer her resignation, and Prime Minister Boris Johnson failed to force her to resign, however, in part due to the fact that she was 
kind of was known as a big beast um, within the Conservative Party, um, with a lot of political power, and she was very popular with the right wing of the Conservative Party due to her strong stance on immigration. Sir Alex Allen, the author of the report, the author of the report, then even resigned himself in process in protest of the fact his findings were completely ignored. This shows that individual ministerial responsibility in relation to personal conduct was not important, despite a clear breach of the ministerial code and a clear breach of IMR, um, in part due to political party considerations. Next example, um, we kind of quickly kind of already touched on this, is Gavin Williamson in 2020. So in the summer of 2020, Education Secretary Gavin Williamson oversaw major failings in his department, in particular, the failure of, it, of the exams algorithm to determine GCSE and A-level results. Despite this, he remained in office for over a year after, so failing to resign. Head of Ofqual, Sally Collier, as we mentioned, who's a civil servant, did resign though. And this shows that individual ministerial responsibility in relation to departmental failures was not important despite a clear breach of the ministerial code. But the civil servant allowed to take the blame by both Williamson and Prime Minister Boris Johnson. So that really does suggest um, a declining importance, especially under Johnson, of individual ministerial responsibility. And the key example um, in 2022 is Boris Johnson himself when he was Prime Minister. So in 2022, the Partygate scandal broke out in the media, revealing that there had been a number of parties in number 10 during the COVID lockdowns that had broken the government's own laws and guidance. Boris Johnson and other key ministers attended, whilst Johnson specifically knowingly misled Parliament about the parties. Despite this, Johnson didn't resign. As mentioned above, in May 2022, Johnson then changed the ministerial code to weaken the rules on individual ministerial responsibility um, so that ministers who breach the ministerial code are no longer expected to resign but can just apologise or accept a reduction in pay. This key example shows that individual ministerial responsibility in relation to personal conduct and responsibility of a department was very unimportant and had broken down under Boris Johnson's government. Crucially, it also shows that IMR is a weak convention that is very dependent on the Prime Minister as judge, jury and executioner. And if the Prime Minister themselves has broken individual ministerial responsibility, there's no mechanism to hold them to account. The final example I've got in relation to individual ministerial responsibility is Dominic Raab in 2023. So Deputy Prime Minister and Secretary of State for Justice Dominic Raab has stayed in place despite allegations of bullying and mistreatment of staff from over 20 civil servants. Rishi Sunak failed to force Raab was to resign immediately. Instead, he set up an inquiry into the bullying allegations in February 2023. Raab has promised to resign from the government if the inquiry concludes that he bullied civil servants. This could be used to show that IMR um, in relation to personal conduct isn't still important, as Sunak's failed to take decisive action and use an inquiry to delay. On the other hand, if the inquiry does find um, that Raab bullied civil servants and he does then resign, it could suggest that individual ministerial responsibility is again important under Rishi Sunak as Prime Minister. So there are some really key examples and we look at kind of what each of them show. I'm going to now wrap up individual ministerial responsibility looking at by looking at the overall debate on whether it continues to be important. First looking at some arguments that it doesn't, then looking at some arguments that it does. So first looking at the arguments that it doesn't remain important. Individual ministerial responsibility is very dependent on the personal honour of individual ministers who are unlikely to offer their resignations if it would damage their career prospects and mean they take a pay cut. This is especially the case um, if an individual prime minister is very important to the career prospects of an individual minister um, and if they're, and they're unpopular with other parts of the party. Because if they resign from the government with this kind of popular prime minister, they're quite unlikely to get in, kind of become a minister again under a different prime minister. The second argument is that individual ministerial responsibility is very dependent on the Prime Minister as judge, jury and executioner. This is a big weakness, as firstly, Prime Ministers are hesitant to make their government look weak or incompetent by sacking ministers. It's kind of accepting that the government's failed, right? Um, secondly, Prime Ministers don't like forcing resignations from political allies that they can rely on, as can be seen, for example, in the Priti Patel example. Thirdly, some Prime Ministers, um, Boris Johnson especially, have very low standards in relation to personal conduct um, and departmental performance themselves. And therefore, if they've got low standards and they, they don't care that much um, about personal conduct issues um, or the running of departments, then individual ministerial responsibility really isn't that important anymore. 
The third argument is that rather than following the ministerial code, prime ministers often decide whether to force resignations of ministers based on the media and public backlash and the extent to which it's damaging their personal popularity and the popularity of their party. Tony Blair's spin, Dr Alistair Campbell, was believed to have had a golden rule that a minister should resign if they were at the centre of a media storm for a given length of time. So this suggests that individual ministerial responsibility isn't important. So it's not actually the responsibility for department or the personal conduct that's important and whether they've broken the ministerial code that's important. It's the backlash that the government's getting um, for this breaking of the ministerial code um, and it's decided in relation to that rather than the kind of letter of the ministerial code itself. Now the final argument is well, the most important argument, um, in my opinion, is that was there was a near complete breakdown of individual ministerial responsibility under Boris Johnson. And it's possible that this has set a precedent that has permanently weakened the convention. This can perhaps be seen in Sulak's long delay in sacking Zahawi, suggesting it was based on the media backlash and failure to quickly force the resignation of Dominic Raab, despite many allegations of bullying. So Boris Johnson's kind of very weak enforcement of individual ministerial responsibility um, and the fact it was kind of pretty much unimportant, completely unimportant um, under his government could have set a precedent and allowed future prime ministers, including Sunak, um, to be very lax with the implementation of individual ministerial responsibility. On the other hand, I've got a couple of arguments that it could be used to suggest it does remain important. So though individual ministerial responsibility was unimportant in Johnson's government, it could be argued that this was an aberration due to his personal low standards and that individual ministerial responsibility has become important again under Truss and now Sunak. The resignations of Braveman under Truss and Zahawi under Sunak could suggest that individual ministerial responsibility has regained importance, which may also lead to Raab being sacked after the conclusion of the independent inquiry. Under a Keir Starmer Labour government, individual ministerial responsibility may become important again, as Starmer is likely to hold his ministers um, to higher standards if he does get into power. So yeah, that's pretty much everything in relation to individual uh, ministerial responsibility. Finally, going to quickly look at some potential reforms to individual ministerial responsibility. So to really enforce and improve it, the powers of judge, jury and executioner would have to be taken out of individual prime minister's hands and given to an independent body with the power to enforce a ministerial code. Because the fact that the prime minister is judge, jury and executioner, it's a kind of complete convention um, and the Prime Minister can't be held to account is the kind of key reason why it's often um, very un uh, often very unimportant. This is highly unlikely however as it would involve a Prime Minister voluntarily giving up their key power of patronage and could risk themselves being forced risk themselves being forced to resign if they break the ministerial code. So even though there are a lot of problems with individual ministerial responsibility it's very unlikely to be reformed. Okay, so that was individual ministerial responsibility. What I'm going to look at now is collective ministerial responsibility. So starting off with the concept of collective ministerial responsibility itself. Like individual ministerial responsibility, collective ministerial responsibility is a convention that is included in the ministerial code and applies to all ministers. It's intended to promote government unity in the face of opposition and mean that the government as a whole is responsible to parliament for its decisions. As with individual ministerial responsibility, is enforced by the Prime Minister, who is supposed to use their powers of patronage to force ministers, ministerial resignations if it isn't followed. So, what are the key aspects of collective ministerial responsibility? Firstly, government ministers are collectively responsible for all of the government's policies and must therefore all resign if the government loses a vote of confidence in Parliament. Secondly, ministers can privately disagree in cabinet meetings, but the discussions in these meetings are kept secret and ministers must support and defend all government policies and decisions in public and in the media, even if they personally or privately disagree with them. A minister must resign from the government um, but before publicly criticising government policy. If a minister criticises government policy without resigning, then the prime minister should force them to resign. Not all resignations um, have to do with matters of principle, but may be complicated by personality clashes um, and ambitions, though. Um, kind of kind of personal career ambitions. Yeah. So resignations on the grounds of collective ministerial responsibility um, are very rare, as resigning from the government can end a minister's political career. And rather than taking a public stand, ministers are more likely to kind of leak their dissatisfaction to the media or fight their corner within the government. 
So now we're going to look at some limits and exceptions to collective ministerial responsibility. So first looking at exceptions. So prime ministers can decide to suspend collective ministerial responsibility if they deem it necessary for the government to function effectively or politically are advantageous to do so. For example, if it prevents um, their party becoming divided. So they can kind of suspend it on some key issues. The first of these is free votes. So on certain controversial or sensitive issues, prime ministers have allowed free votes where ministers are allowed to vote how they wish and all kind of members of their party are allowed to vote how they wish. David Cameron did this in 2013 um, in relation to um, the legalisation of same-sex marriage, which Philip Hammond, who was a minister at the time, um, voted against. And in March 2023, Rishi Sunak said he would allow, would allow a free vote on the imposition of sanctions against former Prime Minister Boris Johnson if he is found by the Privilege Committee um, to have lied to Parliament over Partygate. The next kind of exception to collective ministerial responsibility is referendums. So Prime Ministers have frequently suspended collective ministerial responsibility during referendums in order to prevent the issue of the referendum dividing and harming the government and the governing party. In the 1975 European Communities referendum, Harold Wilson recognised that he had to allow ministers to campaign on both sides of the argument in order to prevent resignations by anti-Europeans. Anti-Europeans were allowed to argue their cases in public, but then had to unite behind the people's verdict. The only condition was that the official government position was to remain in Europe and opponents couldn't speak against membership from the dispatch box in the House of Commons a rule which industry minister Eric Heffer was sacked for breaking. Cameron faced an equally divided Conservative Party in the 2016 um, EU referendum and reluctantly agreed to suspend collective ministerial responsibility on the European issue, which saw ministers, um, especially Michael Gove, campaigning for the Leave side. The final kind of exception to collective ministerial responsibility is coalitions, and this was in the 2010 coalition government. When from the outset, it was agreed that Lib Dem ministers wouldn't be bound by collective ministerial responsibility on four key issues on which they strongly disagreed with the Conservatives. And as a consequence, they were allowed to abstain in votes on the construction of nuclear power stations, tax allowances for married couples, higher education funding and the renewal of Trident. The parties also took opposing sides in the 2011 alternative vote referendum. So, Collective ministerial responsibility is kind of enforced by the prime minister and can therefore be suspended over particular issues if they deem it kind of um, necessary to do so. So they're the exceptions to collective ministerial responsibility and they're things that the prime minister kind of actively decides to do and allows to happen. There are also limits to collective ministerial responsibility. Um, and these are kind of where the convention has limited powers in certain situations, particularly when prime ministers are weak within their party and therefore can't risk forcing the resignation of important figures within the party, otherwise it might bring um, them as Prime Minister down. So the first of these is leaking. Um, rather than publicly resigning, ministers who disagree with government policy sometimes leak their dissatisfa dissatisfaction to the media and to the rest of the party. So that's not um, abiding by collective ministerial responsibility of supporting government policy all the time in public. If they're accused of leaking, they can deny it and maintain plausible deniability. Um, so that's kind of, though they're leaking, they don't really own up to it and therefore don't resign um, as a consequence of it. The second kind of limit to um, collective ministerial responsibility is in relation to big beasts um, who are above collective ministerial responsibility. So some ministers who are important figures within politics and the government's party, so known as big beasts, are in effect often above collective ministerial responsibility as they're too powerful or popular to sack. As sacking them may cause a revolt from a part of the party and therefore risk bringing down the government. As a result, they're able to anonymously, anonymously or quietly brief against the government or other ministers. And the third limit to um, individual, uh, to collective, sorry, ministerial responsibility is ideological disunity within the party. So if the governing party, and therefore the government, is fundamentally, fundamentally ideologically disunited, then collective ministerial responsibility becomes limited as a concept. Under Theresa May, for example, the divide within the Tory party and government between hardline Brexiteers, including the European Research Group, um, and One Nation Conservatives, such as Philip Hammond, who is Chancellor, um, made maintaining government unity extremely difficult. So in these kind of situations where, where there can be leaking, where you have big beasts, and where there's ideological disunity within, um, within the party, 
collective ministerial responsibility is limited to a certain extent. As with individual ministerial responsibility, I'm now going to look at some examples of collective ministerial responsibility and what they show. So starting off with um, examples where CMR was important. The first of these is Lord Wolfson over Partygate in 2022. So in April 2022, Justice Minister Lord Wolfson resigned from the government as he said he couldn't continue to support a government that broke the law and failed to accept collective ministerial responsibility for breaking the law um, with numerous parties in number 10 during lockdown. This shows that um, collective responsibility was still important as Wolfson resigned rather than accepting collective responsibility for the government's actions. The next example um, is Robin Cook over the Iraq war in 2003. And this is kind of the classic example of a resignation in relation to collective ministerial responsibility. Um, and that was um, that was leader of the House, Robin Cook, um, resigning because he didn't want to accept collective ministerial responsibility on a particular issue um, out of principle. And that was Blair's decision to in invade Iraq. In a resignation speech in Parliament, he stated that he could not accept collective responsibility for the decision to commit Britain um, to military action in Iraq without international agreement or domestic support. This shows how collective ministerial responsibility was important as a minister resigned rather than having to publicly support the government in relation to a policy he disagreed with. And the final example I've got, um, a more recent one of um, collective ministerial responsibility applying, is in relation to Rishi Sunak over the Northern Ireland Protocol. So when he was Chancellor in Boris Johnson's government, Rishi Sunak publicly supported and voted for the Northern Ireland Protocol that was a key part of Boris Johnson's Brexit deal. In February 2023, when Prime Minister himself, though, Sunak criticised the Northern Ireland Protocol um, for involving too much paperwork, too many custom checks and creating a border in the Irish Sea. And he replaced it with the Windsor Framework, which fixed these problems. This shows that collective ministerial responsibility was important when he was Chancellor, as he may have um, privately disagreed with the government's Northern Ireland Protocol, um, but he publicly supported it in the media. So there are examples where to kind of show it was important. Going to look at now some examples um, that show it kind of where it hasn't been important. The first of these is Boris Johnson leaking when Foreign Secretary under Theresa May. So when Foreign Secretary in Theresa May's government, Boris Johnson consistently leaked his dissatisfaction with government policy and briefed against the Prime Minister Theresa May, including writing critical weekly articles in the Daily Telegraph while a minister of the government. Due to his popularity within the Tory party, particularly with Brexiteers, and due to May's weakness as a Prime Minister, she wasn't able to sack him though. This shows how collective ministerial responsibility was limited in importance under Theresa May, as the fact she was a weak Prime Minister presiding over an ideologically divided party meant she couldn't enforce it, especially for Boris Johnson, who was a big beast. The next example is Penny Morden and Robert Buckland under Liz Truss in 2022. In October 2022, leader of the House, House of Commons, Penny Morden, and Welsh Secretary Robert Buckland publicly opposed Liz Truss's government's policy that benefits shouldn't rise with inflation, but they didn't resign. This shows that collective ministerial responsibility wasn't important in a weak Liz Truss government, as min government ministers publicly opposed um, government policy without resigning or being forced to resign. And the final example is Steve Barclay under Theresa May in 2019, and this one's kind of really hard to believe. Um, but in March 2019, Brexit Secretary Steve Barclay voted against his government's own plans to extend Article 50 in relation to Brexit, despite defending the plans in the House of Commons as Brexit Secretary just hours earlier. So he voted against kind of exactly what he was introducing. Um, the vote was not a free vote, and Barclay didn't resign in his role, nor was forced to resign afterwards. This shows how collective ministerial responsibility significantly broke down under Theresa May, who was unable to enforce it due to her weakness as a party leader and prime minister. So yeah, there are all the examples in relation to collective ministerial responsibility. I'm going to now look at, kind of, go back to some key arguments and the overall debate over how important it is. So firstly, looking at arguments that collective ministerial responsibility doesn't remain important. The first of these um, is the fact that collective ministerial responsibility has been relaxed at times by prime ministers in a number of areas, including free votes, referendums and coalitions, could be used to suggest that it's no longer important, as if it's kind of being relaxed and has to be um, kind of limited in a lot of different ways, then it can be seen as unimportant. Secondly, collective ministerial responsibility has also been shown to break down to a significant extent when prime ministers are weak 
and the governing party is ideologically divided. With um, ministers, especially big beasts, able to leak their dissatisfaction, brief against the government and even vote against the government without resigning or being sacked by the Prime Minister. Theresa May and Liz Truss's governments are key examples of this. On the other hand, there's some examples of some arguments, sorry, that collective ministerial responsibility does remain important. So it can be argued that collective ministerial responsibility is important um, the vast majority of the time, especially when prime ministers are stronger. Ministers very rarely speak out against the government in public, even if they disagree with government policy, as can be seen with that Rishi Sunak example, while some ministers have resigned due to not being able to accept collective ministerial responsibility. They are therefore bound by collective responsibility. And collective ministerial responsibility is effective in allowing the prime minister to use their powers of patronage um, to control the party and government, whilst encouraging important debates within government behind the scenes, but maintaining government um, unity publicly. Rishi Sunak has so far had fewer problems with collective ministerial responsibility than Liz Trust and Theresa May did, suggesting it may again be important. And the fact that collective ministerial responsibility is sometimes relaxed in relation to those free votes, in relation to coalitions, in relation to referendums, can be seen, um, so they're relaxed as a necessity to ensure the government can continue to function. On what that can um, could be used to show its flexibility, um, which can be seen as a strength of collective ministerial responsibility and something that allows it to continue to be important. So yeah, that's everything in, um, in relation to the content. So I go over that again, look at those um, debates, look at, okay, what do you think about how important they are? I think it's especially kind of likely that you'll conclude that individual ministerial responsibility is a lot less important than collective ministerial responsibility is. Kind of my view is that collective ministerial responsibility um, is pretty important most of the time. Of course, there's limitations to it. Of course, there's exceptions. But most of the time, collective ministerial responsibility does apply um, as a convention. Individual ministerial responsibility, on the other hand, a lot of the time doesn't apply. It's, it's very weak and very dependent on the individual prime minister. I think party gets done um, and kind of the very weak standards of um, ministerial responsibility under Boris Johnson has done um, permanent damage, and especially as he changed the ministerial code. But I think other governments could come back and change that. And that, again, just shows how it's very dependent on the individual prime minister. So yeah, that's everything in terms of the content. Uh, just going back to um, the kind of essay questions, as I said, if you prepare that, that question in bold, you should be pretty prepared um, for the exam. Um, so the first one on responsibility for department and missing parliament, and the second one on personal conduct, and then the third paragraph on collective ministerial responsibility, with for and against in each, and a, a mini conclusion or evaluation um, at the end of each. And to be honest, it's going to be quite an example-heavy essay. Um, so go back to those examples in the video and learn a few of them well. So yeah, that's pretty much everything. Um, let me know if you've got any questions um, or comments in the comment section below and I'll get back to you. Um, and as I said at the start of the video, if you're interested in tutoring, um, go to the Politics Explained website in the first link in the description, where you can also find a lot of essay plans um, and other free and paid resources to help you in your politics A-level. So yeah, thank you very much.